My name is Nigel, I'm your presenter for today. This session is a Sunshine Courses Accounting course, and we're dealing today with the accounting module on debtors and creditors. So we're going to start with debtors on the basis that creditors is very similar to debtors. So once we've gone through debtors, We'll touch on creditors as how it differs, but essentially it's the same as debtors. So we're going to talk about the principle of debtors. We're going to talk about invoicing, how you account for receipts and payments, and then we're going to deal with some practical issues, in particular debt collecting, how you manage credits or bad debts, how you manage receipts in advance, and then a few practical tips to make your life easier and to manage the accounts that much better. So the basic principle of debtors is the same that we've been talking about with most of our balance sheet items. It's to do with matching. Debtors matches the cash flows with the related sales where the cash flows and the sales occur in different periods. Remember, the purpose of accounts is to keep track of assets and liabilities at the beginning of a period, then to account for the profit or loss during the period, and then to account for the assets or liabilities at the end of the period. So we have to match where we've got some costs or revenues or assets or liabilities happening in one period, and others that are related to it that happen in another period, we use balance sheet items as the means to match the related revenues and costs so that we always account for the revenues and costs of the same items in the same accounting period. That's the way we get our profits to mean something, be something meaningful. And in this example, we've got uh, some transactions in January, February, and March. And in this particular example, we're dealing with a company that sells tractors and actually software as well, it's where that it runs its tractors, uh, manages farming, I should say. So in this case, in February, we're selling tw uh, 10 tractors and that we're gonna receive 20,000 pounds for it in total. In the stock section, the stock module, we talked about matching the related costs to the sales. But in this particular example, the sales happen in February, and we define the period in which sales happen by reference to the day or the date in which the goods or services are delivered. The dates that the goods or services are delivered. That determines the month that the sales are recorded in, and that in turn determines the period the costs should uh, relate to. And if the cash flows happen in any different period, we use balance sheet items to move the costs or revenues from the wrong period to the right period, if wrong or right is about the correct period for profit purposes. So in this case, we deliver 10 tractors in the month of February, and it doesn't matter when we receive the cash. But in this example, we actually receive some of the cash for those 10 tractors in January, some in February, and some in March. Just very briefly tell you how that might happen. In the month of February, we knew we were selling quite a lot of tractors, but in January, one of our customers says, I need to have a tractor urgently. I can't afford for you not to have the stock. And we say, look, if we're gonna get the stock, we're gonna to have to pay in advance so we can go and buy it. And the customer says, great, I'll pay you in advance. You then go and buy the stock, and then in February, deliver it to me when you can. So that's how the January payment comes ahead. Then in February, we make various sales and actually we get paid for some of them. In this case, it's four tractors. And in the month of February so far, we've had the January payment for one tractor. We've received money for another four tractors against sales of 10 tractors. So at the end of February, we're short five tractors. We're short receipts of money for five tractors. And the difference between what we've sold and the money we've had in for it is what our debtors are. They're an asset 
because we expect money to come through in the future. And that's it as at the end of February. And of course, in this example, in the month of March, the five, uh, the balancing five tractors are paid for, uh, the 9,000 pounds, which brings our total back to 20,000 pounds. So we sold the 10 tractors, received money in January and February and March. And in respect of the February receipts, because the money comes in in the same period as the sales, we don't have any balance implications, but for both the January and the March ones we do. I'm gonna deal with the January one later. Let me deal with the easier ones first, the one that's much more common, which is when we raise an invoice and we get paid for it later. So we're gonna raise the invoice in February. We're gonna get paid in March. We have a debtor at the end of March, at the end of February, I should say. But the one thing I just need to draw your attention to is when we raise the invoice in February, we don't know when we're going to be paid. We don't know if we're going to get paid in February or in March. So we need an accounting system that doesn't really mind one way or another. And the way we deal with that is we raise an invoice in February, record the whole of the amount in February, whether or not we're going to get receive, receive the money in February. At the time we record the invoice, we don't really care when the money is going to come in. So if the money comes in in February, in this case, we receive money for four tractors, it just eliminates the debtor as at the end of February. But we don't really care when we're recording the original 10 tractors. And of course, in March, we get the final payment and our debtor gets eliminated. And that's just a very simple accounting mechanism by which we uh, can comfortably accommodate getting receiving money in both the same month and future months without having to change our accounting system depending on which it is. So just before we get into the detail of how you record this and what it looks like in the accounts, I just want to talk to you very briefly about the invoice itself. And the reason I want to do this is although it sounds pretty obvious, there's certain legal requirements of the minimum information you have to have in a sales invoice. There are also some information that's really useful to put in there to make your life easier to get paid. So in this example, I've listed out a few of the things that you have to put in an invoice, and I've given an illustration of what the invoice looks like. Um, if you can't read it well, don't worry, because in the... Um, website where you're hopefully um, watching this uh, uh, this video from the, the sunshine.courses website, uh, I'll include the, uh, the document with the sales invoice so you can edit it, change it, update it, read it, do whatever you want with it. So if you can't read it, don't worry. But some of the things that you have to put on, at least in the UK by law, is you have to put your business name, address, and your registered company number if you're a limited company. This is the minimum that's required to say who it is that's entering the contract. Is it you as a, an individual? Are you a sole trader? Is it you as a partnership where you're working with other people? Is it you as a trust? You as a limited company, as a public company, as a government agency? Who is it that's entering the contract? That's what the business name, address, and registered number is all about. You have to put the invoice date. The invoice date seems quite obvious and easy, but actually it's a little bit more complicated than it sounds. Remember that the key date from accounts when we're recording uh, an invoice or a transaction is the date that we deliver goods and services. The date we deliver the goods and services. So in this case, we're selling tractors and we're delivering the tractors over the, uh, during February. So the invoice date really is quite easy. The invoice date is the same as the delivery date. But this company also sells ser uh, services and there are lots of different types of services um, that you could sell, uh, consulting, advice. In this particular example, the services are programming. And what they program is for farmers uh, ways of maximizing the uh, the turn the, the uh, crop productivity of the of the field where you sow what, what time of year you sow how much water to put in when you harvest these sort of things 
you can really significantly change the impact of your farming. So this company that we're looking at at the moment writes software and the software is a service. We're selling a service. And during the month of February, there's a bunch of time that we spend creating these, the program. Now, as it happens, it's going to take quite a while before we um, finish the program. So a lot of this is work in progress. But the invoice date, in this case, probably will be the end of February. Not because each individual hour was worked at the end of February. It's just that is the period at which you're invoicing for those services. So there's the invoice date, as I said, is, is quite complicated. But the, the key point is with an invoice date is you're trying to identify the date on which the goods or services are delivered. And sometimes we invoice in advance. So if you remember, I said with the uh, customer that we had that wanted the tractor in January, they said, we insist that you invoice us, uh, that you, we're, we're gonna pay you in advance. In that case, the invoice date is probably the date that you ask for payment to be made. And that's valid. Uh, so generally, it's the date you deliver the service, but just occasionally it's uh, varied. And just use your common sense as to what an appropriate date is. If you can't validly put or can't reliably, usefully put the date of the supply of goods or services. But if you can, that's without question the best, de best date to put in. And legally, there's a lot of benefits and, and requirements in certain, most circumstances. Put in the customer's name and address. Uh, put in what you're selling them. I'm not sure if that's a legal requirement, but it's common sense that if you then subsequently have a dispute, you want to know what it is that you've actually sold them. Uh, you need to include by law the total amount due. If you've got sales tax, we're going to have a separate module completely on tax. Uh, but if there's a sales tax, you have to include the sales tax reference, the amount of tax rate and the amount of tax you're charging. You don't have to, but it's optional, very good practice to put the terms of trading. So if, for example, you need cash on invoice or cash on delivery, payment on delivery, put that in the terms. Typically, people give 30 days credit. And if that's what you're doing to your customer, uh, put in the terms 30 day uh, payment due, payment within 30 days of the invoice, within 30 days of the invoice date, for example, or whatever your terms are. Uh, and you don't have to put your bank details, but it's a really good idea. You want to make it as easy as possible for people, people to pay you. So just a good idea. So that's just a, an illustration of um, what goes in a sales invoice. Uh, and as I said, once you've configured and set up either your software or your, um, your word process documents or your, or your spreadsheets to in, issue invoices, it's all very easy. But setting it up initially takes a little bit of effort to get it right, but when you do, it'll save you a huge amount of time uh, if you get it right in the first place. So we're now going to switch over to the computerized accounting system. And we're now going to show you how you record a sales invoice uh, and how you record receipts. And there's a couple of other things we'll talk through as well. Just before we look at the invoicing, I want to show you what the accounts look like. And the reason for this is I want to, you to get a, a really good feel for how the accounts change when we enter the invoices. So I'm just doing, going to do a quick report for the profit and loss accounts. And I've already entered a few transactions. Um, I just wanted to make the profit and loss account a little bit more meaningful. So all of these transactions were recorded in respect of, uh, uh, of transactions that happened in February, that's what we're recording it. And if you click on any of these uh, account categories, rent rates and water is 3,400 pounds, rent 12,500. If you click on the category, it'll take you back to where that original transaction came from. And hopefully that'll take you back to an audit trail so you can go back to the original invoice uh, or the original charge so you can confirm that the costs are correct if you need to validate it. Um, so just to highlight this, we pay our programmers 2,100 pounds in the month of February. 
They're part of our cost of sales. I'll explain that in a minute when we've entered the sales and the other purchases. We've got administrative expenses of water, uh, rent, rates, light and heat, travel expenses, advertising insurance. These are very typical. This is a very typical portfolio of uh, um, array of expenses. And the total expenses in the month are 80, just under 18,000 pounds, 17,920 pounds. When you add it to the 2,000 pounds of the programmers, the operating loss so far is 20,000 pounds. Now we haven't yet recorded the income, so it doesn't mean we've lost the money, but that's what the accounts show before we enter our invoices. I will just say, typically, you don't wait to the end of the month to raise the invoices. The only reason I haven't entered them as we were going through is because the whole point of this module is for you to see what the impact is of the invoices. So I'm also going to have a quick look at the balance sheet. And the balance sheet shows total bank account overdraft of £10,000. It shows an owner's a loan from the owner of £10,000. So what happened is at the beginning of the period, the owner injected £10,000 to the business, put the cash into the bank, but we've on the face of it lost £20,000. We haven't because we haven't yet recorded everything, but if this had been everything, we've lost £20,000 and that's funded by having gone into overdraft of, we started off with 10,000 for the owner, we've lost 20, just over 20,000. So our overdraft is just over 10,000 pounds. That's before we record the income or the purchases. And I'm now going to show you how we record the income. So I should just mention this accounting software is called Capium. There's lots of different accounting software. There'll be a separate module which will talk about which accounting software you want to use. But the principles that I'm going through now are going to be common to almost, almost every um, software package that you have, either online or on your computer. But in KPM, um, there's various menu items on the left, and one of them, an item is sales. And you can click on the sales and get the various options. Or you can also do a quick add where I could add an invoice if I want to, or add a receipt or add a purchase. I find this much easier to add from a quick add. Once you get used to it, it doesn't really matter whether you click sales invoice or quick add invoice, it all takes you to the same place. So I've just clicked on the invoice. And at the moment we have no invoices. So I'm gonna enter the first invoice. And the first invoice that we're gonna sell is tractors. So I've clicked on the new invoice, the quick add, add an invoice. So it says here invoice. The date of this invoice is the 18th of February. So I just click on the date and then select from the panel. I could just as easily have typed 1802 2021 if I wanted to do so. Notice here the due date is 18th of February because I haven't put in here that there's any credit period. But if I wanted to, it gives me typical credit periods. I could enter a custom one, but I'm gonna give these customers 30 days to pay. So if this is my terms of trading, I put in the 30 days and the system calculates automatically that the due date is the 20th of March. So if they haven't paid us before the 20th of March, we're happy. If they've paid us, haven't yet paid us, and it's gone beyond the 20th of March, they breach their contract. And we have to call them and say, please pay us now, you're now overdue. So I'm going to click the customer. Um, I've entered a couple of customers already. Uh, you'll notice there's a section here for contacts where I can add customers and suppliers, or I could just click a plus. So if the customer's name is not in this list, I can simply click the plus here and enter it, but I pre-entered a couple of them. And in this particular case, I'm going to sell to ABC Limited. The invoice number, the system defaults to, in this case, invoice one, it's my first invoice. If I'd already got 55 invoices, it would have defaulted to invoice 55. But if I put my own invoicing numbering system in here, for example, if I decided to raise the invoices, to, to number the invoices by reference to the month and the year I'm in, for example, if I want to call it the year 21 March or 21 February, I could call it 2102.1. And the next one would be 2102.2. And depending on how sophisticated your computer system is, it will work out what the next invoice is based on what you, the previous invoice you entered. In this case, I'm just gonna leave it as one because why not? If I wanted to put any notes in here, I could do so. Um, 
typically um, the notes will be relating to a specific customer to a particular request they've got. And it might be that you're only partially delivering their order. And it might be you'll say, I'm going to add another lot of invoice. Uh, uh, the balance of your order will come in 15 days. There's one other bit of information that I'd say is really valuable to put in an invoice. And I would put it in the notes here. And that's the customer's reference number. The customer's reference number, which might be a purchase order or a, or a sales order, or some type of reference where the customer can look up in their own records what they've ordered so that when they receive the invoice, they can match this against their own records and they know that this is a valid invoice. So for example, I might put in here your, your purchase order number, let's just say that's what, what, what it is. I don't have to, but anything I want to do, I can put in here and I could say balance, Balance of order expected um, before um, 28th of February. So I can put whatever I want to put. I don't have to put anything. But now here's the interesting bit. I can now select what it is I'm invoicing. And just as I pre-entered the customer name, I've also pre-entered what I sell. And again, if I want to, change or add to items that are not already in there. If I go into the sales category, one option is to click on the items, and that allows me to enter new items that I sell. And the idea is that you don't have to keep entering the same item over and over and over again. And it's particularly neat because you can put in the item, the sales price, which means if you're selling 10 items, it's already got the sales price in it. You don't have to keep looking it up. Similarly, if I wanted to add an item from here, if I didn't use this menu, I can simply click plus item and it will do so. But here I've got the item. And in this case, I'm selling tractors that are model 200V. And I'm selling, you'll notice the price is a thousand pounds because I've already put it in the system, but I'm actually gonna sell 10 of them. Uh, a couple of, so, um, uh, by default, because of the item that I put in here, the system has defaulted the account to sales. Now, do you remember when we were entering sales and purchases in our cash book uh, spreadsheet system, we had the option of categorizing sales in a more refined way. So we could simply call it sales if we want to do so. If we're just simply selling one item, that's probably all we'd need. But in this case, the company sells both tractors and also software. So I've set up some sales. Uh, I set up vehicle sales and also programming income. So I'm going to click on vehicle sales because that's the category that I want to allocate this to. And it's already calculated for me the 10 items at £1,000, £10,000 is what's due. Now notice, although we haven't yet dealt with VAT, if I had charged VAT or I've got a sales tax rate, I could select the rate Again, when you enter the item, typically it will, you'll be able to def give a default rate and whatever rate you put in, the VAT will be calculated for you and that will flow through to the VAT accounting. Again, we're not gonna deal with VAT in this module. So although you can do it, I'm gonna pretend we're not VAT registered so that we don't have to worry about VAT. Notice the grand total is 10,000 pounds, but I'm gonna add another item because we're selling not just the model 200, we're also gonna sell them the model 400. So I'm going to add a row. This time it's a model tractors 400V. Uh, it's the same customer, which is why I can put it in the same invoice. And we're going to sell them five of this model. That's what they've ordered. Price is 1500 pounds. The system's automatically calculated. I've forgotten to update sales. So if I save this now, I'd have some of the items in vehicle sales and some in sales. So that at the end of the month, when I'm looking through the accounts, I'd see that I made a mistake and I could go back and edit it and change it. But because I picked it up, I'm gonna record as vehicle sales right from the, the get-go. And notice there's in the receipt, there's an option here for trade debtors. What this is allowing you to do 
is to say, this is the invoice. We're not being paid for it now. We're going to be paid for it later. And this is the double entry says, I'm going to debit letters and credit vehicle sales for each of these individual items. Now, of course, if part of this had been sell, a vehicle sales part of it could be programming, I could just as easily call this programming income. Of course, it isn't in this example, but I could have done so. So again, we're debiting debtors, and I could be crediting vehicle sales for the sales bit and programming income for the programming uh, bit. So again, what we're doing is we're categorizing each of the items of sales, and we've got a lot of, lot of flexibility. But now that I've done everything, I'm going to save it, and uh, I'm now going to enter a second, second invoice. So save a new. So I could go through and enter another invoice, but I just want to show you what the accounts look like now before I enter the second invoice. So remember what we did is we debited debtors and we credited vehicle sales. So let's have a look at the profit and loss accounts and see what's happened to the vehicle sales. Look, the vehicle sales show 17 and a half thousand pounds. Nothing else has changed. And on the face of it, it brings our loss down from about 20,000 pounds to about 2,000 pounds. Well, we got more sales, so I'm very happy with that. But let's just have a quick look at the balance sheet. Again, it's not complete, but I just want to see what happened to that 17,000 pounds on the balance sheet. And the answer is, it appears here in trade debtors. So we've got debtors of 17 and a half thousand. We still got the bank overdraft of 10,000 pounds. Nothing's changed because we haven't received any money. And we still owe money to the, uh, to the owner of 10,000 pounds. But our net, like, net deficit has gone from about 20,000, uh, about um, 10,000 pounds to about 2,000 pounds. I can't do the numbers in my head. I think it was net deficit of 20,000 pounds gone to about 2,000 pounds. That, that's more like it. Okay, I'm going to add another invoice. So let's do this a little bit quicker. And the other invoice is um, uh, on the uh, 28th, of, uh, 28th of February. And this invoice is to grants traders. Uh, in this case, I'm not going to give them any credit. Um, typically with grant traders, they pay us on a monthly basis, they pay by standing order, whatever it is. I'm going to ask for payment immediately. And this is just so you can see what happens if someone pays us late. Notice the invoice is automatically updated itself. If I was charging VAT, I could click a button to say the amount I'm entering is including VAT. And some businesses, the price you quote is VAT inclusive, particularly if you're a retailer, for example. So sometimes it's useful to have the amount including VAT. But in this particular case, uh, we sell our programming, we charge VAT on top of that. Again, I could have put some notes in here if I wanted to. I could have put their purchase, their sales order if I wanted to. I could have said that this relates to certain type of contract if I wanted to. I'm not going to bother to put anything if I, uh, because I don't really want to. Um, this time, it's software coding. Uh, we're charging 20 hours of programming, and the hourly charge rate is £50 an hour. The, we're going to uh, allocate this to programming income. And look, the net amount is automatically calculated with 20 times 20 hours at 50 pounds an hour is a thousand pounds. Gone to trade debtors, trade, trade debtors. I could have put something else in if I wanted to. For example, if it was a payment rather than a debtor, I could simply put payments or uh, the bank. And I'm going to save and close this one. And I'm now going to have another look at what the profit and loss account shows. So look at the profit and loss account. And this time I've got 17,000 pounds of vehicle sales and programming income of 1,000 pounds. So total of 18,000 pounds. We pay programmers of 2,000 pounds. So although we got an income of 1,000 pounds, we've paid out to programmers 2,000 pounds. On the face of it, we've lost money. And if you look at the stock module, you'll understand about work in progress and probably we will journal some of this move out of costs into stock. 
but look at the stock module for how to do that. But in this example, I'm pretending that we don't have any work in progress. We just lost money in this particular case. And our gross profit is 16,000 pounds. We've got overheads of 17,000 pounds. Our net loss has gone down to one and a half thousand pounds, which is reduced from two and a half thousand because of this income. So I now want to look at what happens when we receive some money. How do we account for the fact we receive some money from one of our customers? So the answer is you enter it either by a quick ad as to receipt, or we can go back to sales and look for receipts. It doesn't matter which you do. Again, I'm going to do the easy way, quick ad of a receipt. It's already given me a reference number. I could put my own reference number if I wanted to do so. The customer name is, I'm going to have ABC Limited. And the amount that they pay us Okay, apologies for that. I don't know why it's not accepting it. Uh, normally you would put the amount in here. Right? Um, I've clearly done something wrong. I don't know what it is. Um, ah, I have to click the invoice. Okay, apologies for that. I'm not sure what I've done wrong, but for whatever reason, I can't um, show the receipt of, of funds. Um, but were I to do so, um, uh, I'm going to just try and say this. Oh, here we go. That's what it is. Apologies. I don't put the amount here. Um, it's given me the option to of which invoice I want to pay. So I'm just going to start this whole section again. When we come in to enter the receipt, we're, um, we're receiving money from ABC Limited, the system knows how much we've invoiced them already. And in this case, I'm going to say they've paid us 10,000 pounds. So I don't know why they haven't paid us the full amount, but they haven't. And when I put the item in here, it's automatically put an amount received of 10,000 pounds. If there'd be more than one invoice, it would have given me the option to Put different amounts in, in different places uh, and the receipt date i'm going to say i received it not on the 7th of Mar uh, today's date but i'm going to say i received it on the 25th of february so i got a partial receipt of my invoices on the 25th of february and i'm going to save this save this save and save it and i'm going to enter another receipt this time for grant traders the grant traders invoices come in and I'm going to put here again for some reason, I've just had 200 pounds from them, not the full amount. But this I received this I received on the 7th of February, 7th of March. So I now want to look at what the effect is of having entered those two amounts. Click on the profit and loss account. Nothing's changed. Vehicle sales still 17,500, programming 1,000 pounds, our loss is still 1,500. And this is really the point of the balance sheet items. We're not, in the, with debtors, we're not changing the period in which the, um, in which the invoice is recorded. All we're doing is changing the period in which the receipt is recorded. In other words, we're saying, if the money was received in March, but it relates to February, we shouldn't record it in March even though we received it in March, we should record it in February because that's the date it was delivered. So by this mechanism of raising an invoice and then waiting until we get paid before recording the receipt, we've got this very clever way of showing the income in February, even though the money was received in March. So not surprisingly, when we show receipts, it doesn't affect the profit and loss account. It's the invoicing that affects the profit and loss account, not the receipt. What is affected is the balance sheet. So I'm now going to look at the balance sheet and look here. I'm going to look at the balance sheet as at the 28th of February. Okay, so our trade setters at the 28th of February are now eight and a half thousand pounds. But look at our bank balance. Do you remember our bank balance was 10,000 pounds overdrawn at one stage? 
because we've received so much in, we've almost completely paid off our overdraft. And we've got debtors of eight and a half thousand pounds. So we've still got the one th uh, 10 thousand pounds that we owe to the um, to the owner. So our net liability is fifteen thousand uh, five fifteen hundred pounds. It's assets of debt, assets, assets that are eight and a half thousand pounds, and over after twenty five thousand uh, pounds, twenty five pounds, owner's loan ten thousand pounds, total net liability of fifteen hundred pounds, and that represents our profit and loss account. Remember, we treat this as a credit and negative because it's deemed that we owe money to the uh, owner. Uh, anyway, this is a loss, so that was a, a, a different point I was making. So the point I wanted to identify is that our debt is at the end of February and now show correctly that we are owed eight, eight and a half thousand pounds. And our balance sheet looks very different now from when we hadn't recorded the invoices at all. And it just illustrates the importance or the value of having an invoicing system to be able to account for profits and loss, income and expenses in the month in which the uh, transaction should be recorded rather than the month in which the money was received. So the debtors becomes the balance sheet item and that balance sheet item is the mechanism by which we move the receipts in March back to February from a profit and loss account point of view. Good. So I now want to talk about a couple of other bits to do with debtors. We're now getting into the very practical aspect of, of uh, handling debtors, and that's debt collecting. Um, it's all very well having debtors, but if we don't ask the debtors to pay us and they don't pay us, we could have a very bad business model. Um, we'll run out of money very quickly if the people who owe us money don't pay us. So accounting systems typically, all of them have the option for you to see what, who owes you money and how much they owe you, uh, what, it, what that debt is made up of, and whether or not they're overdue. So in the, in the KPM, example of KPM, you go to the menu item of reports, then you go to customer, and then there's a lot of options for customers. One of them, for example, is sales report. If I wanted to list of all my sales in a month, I'm gonna look at the sales for last month. It tells me my total sales were 18,500 pounds for the month of February. Mildly interesting. Um, you can get that from lots of other ways, but this could be useful in, in some cases. Um, much more important from a debtor's point of view is a, is a, sorry, is a customer's customer list. Thank you, pardon. The customer list just tells you, I'm gonna come back to the customer list in a minute, apologies. I'm going to look at the customer's aging list. That's reports, customer, customer aging list because this is the report that's um, so significant. And as at the day, the only thing that's outstanding is ABC Limited, who owe us seven and a half thousand pounds. And if you look at this report, it's split between amounts due from one to 30 days, 31 to 60, 61 to 90. And what all accounting systems do is they tell you which period, how old your debts are. So in this particular case, I'm just looking at ABC Limited. I could also have looked at Grants Traders and that shows 800 pounds or within one to 30 days, or I could look at all of them. And this gives me a complete list of all the debtors I'm owed. And what you'll find is after two or three months, this starts to become extremely useful because you can home in very quickly on the debtors who aren't paying you. If you don't keep track of this, what you'll find is that you trade with people who are more and more and more in arrears, and then all of a sudden you're not, uh, you, you run the risk of them being so indebted to you that you start to become desperate for their money. And if they're, for example, going bust themselves or they've got cash flow problems, it could be that they will create cash flow problems for you because they've got cash flow problems. And yet if you're on top of your, your debtors, maybe by the time they got to the 61 to 90 days, 
you'd recognize that they were being slow to pay. And you might say to them, look, unless you pay us, we can't deliver any more goods to you. And that way you can avoid getting too exposed to someone that may have cash flow problems that may cause a problem for your business. So this report is a really useful uh, part of the debt collecting process to be able to see the most urgent debts, both in terms of age and also amounts. So in this case, ABC Limited is the one that you'd be chasing up for urgently because you really could do with having that money. As it happens, it's not overdue because we've allowed them this period. And if I wanted to see how that's made up, I can click on ABC Limited and it will break down the invoices that are outstanding. So if I click here from the, the start here from the beginning of February, it lists the invoice that we've received, less the amount of money we've received, uh, which shows total 17 and a half thousand pounds come in, 10,000 has gone out. Um, so that tells us how much is still left to us. So if we go to them and say, please pay us the balance of money of the debt, if they say they've already paid 10,000 pounds, we can say, yes, you pay 10,000 pounds against a, per a sale of 17 and a half thousand pounds. Look, your purchase order number was 75113. Please look it up. We've told you on the invoice, the balance of order is expected before the 28th of February. Please would you pay us, even though this amount isn't outstanding, and then you can discuss how you want to. If you've already given the credit, you may say that's fine, you can pay us when it's due, but if it's beyond overdue, you can say to them, please pay us now. So a couple of other useful, very useful reports, coming back to reports, customer, is the customer statement. So it's one thing calling up somebody and saying, please pay the amount due, but that's quite time consuming. And typically people have systems, accounting systems themselves, that have lots of customers, lots of suppliers. And typically what you want to do is on a regular basis, email or send by post if necessary, but send a statement to your customer of how much they owe you. And this is because their accounting systems may not be very good, but if you've got your own statement that you send to them and you send it on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, you're very gently nudging them to pay you. And if after a couple of months they haven't paid and you send them a couple of statements and they still haven't paid, then when you telephone them, they're already aware they owe you the money. Now, quite a lot of businesses that you sell to particularly if you give them credit, if they're not sophisticated, may genuinely not know that they owe you money. You might think it's ridiculous, how could that be? But if they're not that well organized, and if they've got lots and lots and lots of suppliers, and particularly if they're overworked themselves, they may just be unaware of it. It may be that they're slow with their own accounting system, they're not up to date with things. So when you send the statement, even if their own records are not up to date, you're nudging them to pay you. And one of the most significant um, aspects of debt collecting is sending out regularly this statement. So with all accounting systems, you can list a customer statement. You can export it either as an Excel spreadsheet or as a PDF. And what I do is I typically export as a PDF, save it to disk, and then email them the, uh, the um, uh, statement, typically with a note saying, Here's a statement of amount due. You owe us seven and a half thousand pounds. If they're overdue, I'll say you're now overdue. This was overdue on such and such date. Please will you arrange for payment now? And if it's not overdue, I say the amount is due for payment by such and such. Please ensure you've transferred the funds to our account. The, our bank details are already on the invoice, so you don't need to look up anything. That sort of very gentle, polite, nudgy way of, uh, of chasing up, uh, of asking for debts. And the reason it's so important is if you don't keep on track of your debts, you will find that they gradually get older and older and older. Customers start to forget what you've sold them. Sometimes you get disputes because it's not so easy to remember what it is that they've received, particularly if you're selling services. They may say, no, I already received that service. You've invoiced it, but no, you've invoiced it also in the month beforehand. And you may have really good records and you can explain to them, no, this was a service for ABC. The second invoice was an invoice for DEF. 
please now pay us. You might have these really good records, but it's quite time consuming. And if you don't have really good records, um, time means you'll forget what, was, uh, what, what you delivered. So the more timely you can send out your statements, the, more, the, the better you are with debt collecting, the quicker your money will come in to fund your business, and the less likely you are to have bad debts with people either disputing or not being able to pay the debts because they've just bought too much, which they've not paid for. So the tip I would have about dealing with invoicing is keep on top of your debtors as a matter of priority. It's really significant for the business. And you'll find that you actually get better relationships with your customers if you keep on top of the debtors. Because again, another thing that get, starts to make relationships really strained is if you have quite a lot of amount of money outstanding and you chase them and they can't really afford to pay, that's when things start getting quite feisty. So if you can do your debt collecting regularly and reliably, you tend to avoid a lot of the stress and friction with customers. And remember, it's the customers from where you receive your profits. So you really don't want to upset them. But by the same token, if they haven't paid you, there's no point in trading with them. So best of all is to encourage them to pay on time. And if you can do that regularly and get in the habit of them paying you and you chase them very quickly or bit politely if they haven't paid you, it's a really invaluable part of what you're doing. And what some uh, companies have separate departments that do debt collecting, some will ask the salespeople to collect debts because they've already got the relationship. But a lot of businesses, are, businesses ask the bookkeeper or the accountant to do the debt collecting. And if you're proficient at doing it, it puts you in a very strong position to support the company, the company you're working for. So the customer statements are a really big deal. So there's just two or three other things we need to talk about. And one of them is what happens if there's a valid reason why you need to give a credit to somebody. Let's say we did that program. Do you remember we did the programming of two and a half thousand pounds, 2000 pounds, I think we charged for it. But it's, uh, what happens if we simply made a mistake on the invoice and instead of charging, let's say we had agreed to charge 10 pounds an hour, but we inadvertently charged them 50 pounds an hour. So the invoice itself is wrong. Or what happens if we charge them the right amount, but they say, no, you charged us for work you had already charged us for. What you were doing is work that was fixing something that you already charged for somewhere else. You've duplicated the charge. There's plenty of other reasons why sometimes the invoices, I'm going to list the invoices again. So I'm going to sales invoices. I'm going to list all the invoices I've raised. And remember, I've got to go to the, I've got to get the period over which the invoices were issued, and I'm going to do them from the 1st of February onwards. So I'm going to list all these invoices. Let's say that this um, two, this hundred pound, this thousand pounds invoice was actually wrong, that they paid us 200 pounds because that's what the invoice should have been. How do we credit this invoice? Well, we could go into the invoice and correct it. So we could go to the invoice itself and edit it, uh, let me just go into the invoice here, and we could edit it. Ah, oh, we can't edit it because we've already entered uh, a receipt for it. I was going to say in any event, it's really bad practice to edit an invoice. Um, the reason it's bad practice is you can very easily lose track of what's gone on. You lose an audit trail if you simply update an invoice. You're much better off either to have a credit note for the difference or to credit the eliminate the whole invoice and instead then raise a new invoice altogether. So we need to credit 800 pounds of this thousand pounds. And if you'll see that beside the new invoice, there's a little drop down list which allows me to enter a new credit note. So the credit note is for grants, traders. And typically I'd want to write in here, um, uh, correct invoice INV2 
um, with uh, over with with incorrect rate charged. So we could have spelled it out in more detail. We charge you at fifty pounds an hour. It should be ten pounds an hour. So the item is the software coding. The quantity is ten is one pound is. Uh, um, if you remember, we did ten hours, and the credit is forty pounds, which I'm going to allocate to programming in income. I beg your pardon. It's twenty hours at forty pounds an hour. So we're crediting eight hundred pounds, which is the amount, if you remember, that hasn't been paid. So when I do save and close. It asks me to allocate which, which invoice to allocate it against. And the reason it does this is if I've got four or five invoices, I want to know which invoices are still outstanding and which aren't. In this case, I'm allocating all of the 800 pounds against this invoice number two. So when I now look at my invoices for the periods of, uh, start again. Um, The this is the list of the credit notes. Can you see I, incorrectly? I forgot to put the date of the credit note. I dated the credit notes on the 7th of Mar March, when actually it should relate to the 28th of February, which I think was the date. So I'm going to edit this if I can. Oh, I may not be able to. Um, uh, it looks like I've just got to delete it and, and, and uh, do it again. But I should would need to correct that date. Um, if I don't, my debtors are, are, are incorrect, but at least it's recorded correctly. But if I go and just have a look at the balance sheet, as at today, because I've got that date wrong, you'll see the £800 is no longer in there as an amount outstanding because I've issued a credit note. But look what happens with the profit and loss accounts. The programming income was a thousand pounds. It's gone down to two hundred pounds because we've credited the eight hundred pounds. Now, as it happens, I've got the invoice date wrong. So, if I put the date of February, it would still show a thousand pounds because I've put the wrong credit note date in. So, I would need to correct that one way or another. But there's one other thing I wanted to talk to you about, which is. Um, Actually, before I do that, do you remember I was saying to you that we need to keep on track of debtors in case they um, are no longer able to pay our invoices? So I'm just going to list out the invoices. And the invoices that we've got is ABC Limited owes £17,500. And the others, you can see the sales and credit notes, are showing as paid. So the only amount that's due is outside the seven and a half thousand pounds. Let's imagine we go through another six months and we still not pay by, uh, by ABC Limited. And when we finally chase them up, they've gone bust. They've gone into liquidation and there's no money due to us. We no longer, um, that invoice is no longer valid because we're not gonna be paid. We need to remove it from trade debtors. And there are two ways you can do it. One is you could issue a credit note. Credit note, this time it would be in the month in which you raise the credit note. And instead of showing the amount, allocating the amount to um, uh, programmer sales, you would allocate to a, a separate account called bad debts. So let's just have a quick look at, let's say we're issuing a new credit note. Let's say ABC Limited. Um, again, I'm going to leave the states here, but it would be at some stage in the future. Um, owe us money. And I'm going to write off the whole of the tractors. I can't even, I'd have to know which tractors it was. I'd forgotten which one it was. Um, but when it comes to sales, oh, I can't do that. Okay, I can't do what I was planning to do. So let's just um, quit this. Um, you'd need to raise an invoice, uh, a journal. And the journal would be uh, credit debtors, debit bad debts. 
So you could just show the credits uh, and credits against sales and then do a journal to move from sales to bad debts. The reason you want to show the movement, you don't want to show it as reduction in sales, but you want to show it as a bad debt, is that in your profit and loss account, if you reduce the sales by 17 and a half thousand pounds or whatever, seven and a half thousand pounds, it's not correct that you haven't had the sales because you did have the sales. It's just that you've got a cost of a bad debt. So if we reduced sales in say six months time, it would, we would incorrectly look as if we've reduced the amount we sell sold in six months time, when actually it's not that our sales have reduced, in six months time, but our costs have increased because we've we've got a bad debt. So we would credit debtors, debit bad, bad debts, you know, or credit sales, debit bad debts, depending on how we recorded it, um, to account for the reduced, the, the, the fact that we've lost the debtor and that the money's been lost. The final thing I just want to identify is, what happens if someone pays this in advance? Do you remember the, uh, when we very first looked at this, we said, the debtor, our customer, wants to pay us some money in advance because they want us to buy a vehicle and the only way we could do it is if they pay us in advance. How do we account for that? If we go into sales, uh, invoices, I'm going to add a new invoice. So I click new invoices. Thank you, pardon, I've gone to the wrong section. I'm gonna do a quick add receipt, not an invoice. I apologize for this. Um, when I click new receipts, can you see this option, make advanced receipts? This says to the system, I'm not paying off an invoice I've already raised. I'm showing a receipt for which I haven't yet raised an invoice. So I'm gonna do make an advanced receipt. In this case, I'm going to, let's say grant traders, they're going to pay us, um, let's say they pay us 5,000 pounds in advance. I'm going to date this on the um, 24th of February. Um, and I'm going to say that this is um, re reference March purchases requested. Now, different accounting systems are more sophisticated more sophisticated than this. I could change the bank account I'm recording it to, but that all looks good to me. So I'm just gonna save this one, save and close. Remember it's 5,000 pounds we've received in advance. So let's just have a quick look at the balance sheet and look at our bank account. Our bank account now shows a positive 5,175 pounds. And look at our debtors. Our debtors shows debt due of 7,500 pounds but a negative amount advanced received. So this is a way by which you can keep track separately where you've received money in advance from customers for whatever reason, the money correctly has gone into the bank, but you've identified it's not because you've made profits, but because you owe them the 5,000 pounds in terms of future work or supplies or whatever it is that you owe them. And the balance sheet allows you to distinguish money is in the bank from, from future obligations. And similarly, by the time our debtors have paid off, that's money that will go into the bank as well. So once our debtors have come through and we've fulfilled our obligation of this 5,000 pounds, the whole of that two and a half thousand pounds will have gone into the bank. The seven and a half thousand will come in less the 5,000 that we've paid out to buy whatever we had to, to do. So the balance sheet is once again come to our rescue. It's allowing us to move cash flows from the period in which they arise into the period that they should be recorded for profit and loss account purposes. It allows us to move the cash flows into the period in which we deliver our goods or services or we receive from our suppliers, our goods or services. Okay, so the final thing I just want to say, the final practical tip, just to summarize that for debtors, is that if you're managing debtors on behalf of a company, firstly, be
be timely about your debt collection. It's such a critical point in terms of stopping debts getting out of control, keeping relationships good with your customers, and making sure the cash flows for your, the business you're working with stay healthy. So be timely. The second thing is be critical when you're looking at the balance sheet as to whether these debtors are validly collectible. Is the value of seven and a half thousand pounds still valid? Partly you might decide we've over invoiced people, we shouldn't have invoiced that amount. Well, you may talk to your uh, salespeople, they will have a very good feel whether that's valid or not. But assuming that's correct, the other thing you need to be critical about is, do the debtors have enough money to pay us? And typically, if a debtor is quite fresh, you don't have to worry too much about it. But if a debt is quite old, if it's 60, 90 days old or more, the chances are either the customer has got cash flow problems or they dispute the invoice. Either way, it calls into question whether we're actually, actually going to receive seven and a half thousand pounds. So as accountants, you need to judge whether that's valid or not. Okay. I'm now going to go back to the presentation and I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, purchases. Because purchases are a mirror image of sales. The principle is exactly the same. We account for the purchases in the month in which we receive the goods or services. So in this case, the month in which we receive the tractors, by the by, if it turns out that the purchases does not match with the sales that it relates to, so the sales of those tractors happens down in a different month from the month in which we've got the purchase, that's the stock module. Look at the stock module, accounting module for how you manage that. But in this case, I'm not worrying about that. I'm worried only about our creditors. So what we have to record is the purchases or, uh, arise in the month in which the goods or services are delivered. And look, we can similarly have payments to suppliers in advance in the month or in arrears. And if we pay in advance, it might be the mirror image of us saying to a supplier of ours, please let us pay for something because we want you to do something for us, maybe buy some goods that you can't pay for, maybe they don't trust us because they don't know us well enough, they won't give us credit. So we might pay somebody in advance. Generally, we're paying in the same month. That may or may not be the case in our business, but in March, we pay for six months, we pay 10,000 pounds about a month after we've received them. So as at the end of February, we owe 10,000 pounds, we have creditors of 10,000 pounds. Remember the balance sheet allows us to recall the cash payments in March, but we can still record the purchases in February. And we do that in exactly the same way as we recorded, um, did with sales. So in the KPM, in the accounting software, there's a section within, instead of sales, it's a section for purchases and you can enter purchase invoices, you can enter credit notes the same way, you can enter payments in the same way. But the principles are identical, uh, albeit mirror images. The invoicing works in exactly the same way. Just the tip when you're entering an invoice is remember to, when you're entering an invoice, a, a supplier's invoice, enter their invoice number when you're putting the number onto our system. If you remember, there are notes, and in more advanced systems, they actually prompt you to enter the supplier's invoice number or the supplier's reference number. And of course, the reason for that is, if a supplier calls you and says, please pay some money, you need to know what invoice they're asking for. The only reference number they will have is their invoice number. So if you haven't recorded their invoice number on our system, it makes it very difficult to identify which invoice they're chasing. So that's just a little tip when you're entering uh, the purchases. Receipts and payments works exactly the same way. I should say payments rather. Um, the uh, credits work in the same way. If they've overcharged you, typically you don't have a bad debt issue when you're talking about creditors. 
um, but uh, but you often have a credit note of a purchase where you might say, I don't accept this invoice, it's wrong, we've agreed a different price. For whatever reason, they issue a credit note, you record it in exactly the same way. Similarly, you can pay money in advance, works in exactly the same way. And then the final thing on credit is the practical tip. This time is not so much about the age of the debt or the uh, timeliness, it's about completeness. The big problem with creditors getting to record an invoice and if you forget to record an invoice your accounts are going to be wrong so completeness is the big challenge for a bookkeeper when you're dealing with creditors it's actually a problem with accounting generally this problem of completeness of suppliers invoices so typically you need an accounting system that will keep track of invoices you're expecting so if the invoice has not come in, you can still record the cost. And that might happen that whenever you receive goods, you have an accounting system that you as an accountant get notified that don't accept any goods. Uh, if, if you don't have some paperwork, which shows what the goods are, return them to the supplier. So if you've got the option or the ability to ins insist on that as an accounting system, what that means is whenever goods come in, you will always get an invoice or some type of notification of what's being received, and you can then record it, even if you haven't had the supplier's invoice directly. Again, some companies, if, if they're really worried about completeness, can send statements in their accounts to their suppliers saying, this is what we owe you, please confirm that this is the same that's in your records. And if you've forgotten to receive an invoice, sometimes that's a way you can pick it up. I don't see that happening very often, but sometimes some businesses find they need it. But whatever it is, you as a bookkeeper need to work with the company that you're working with, or if it's your own business, you need to set up a proper system to prevent missing an invoice for goods that you've received. And particularly if you've got a supplier that's not that good on their own records and they don't invoice you for two or three months and that happens, you need to have, have a way to make sure that even if you haven't received an invoice, you've got a way that you know how much the invoice will be when it comes through so that you can account as a creditor even if you haven't got the invoice. So that's a, a, a bookkeeping requirement. Um, and again, it's a little bit advanced. Most businesses, you won't have a problem with this, particularly the smaller businesses, if you're working for smaller businesses, because the cash flows tend to work much quicker in smaller businesses. Your suppliers don't give you so much leeway. But if you find that when you're making payments or when you're recording invoices for a business, that what you're recording relates to receipts of goods, two or three or goods or services, two or three months ago, then you might need to work a bit harder at developing a system to prevent you're receiving goods or services and failing to record them because you simply haven't received the documentation or perhaps even with your, within your own accounting system, you just haven't got around to recording it because you're overworked, much stuff going on, um, people in your organization are not very good at passing information to you, whatever it is, if you're entering payments, uh, entering invoices relating to goods that are two or three months ago or even longer, you need to consider whether what accounting system you can set up to prevent that in future. So that's the end of the module on debtors and creditors. Thank you once again for listening. What we've covered is why you, why you record debtors and creditors, and it's all to do with matching, is so that you don't limit accounting to the month in which you receive or pay money, but you rather record it in the month in which you receive or deliver the goods. And that's the proper period you should do accounting for. Very small businesses have something called cash accounting where they can record everything on a cash basis. If you're doing that, you don't need to do invoicing in advance. You don't have to have um, uh, debtors or creditors. But for any other business, if you want to wish, do the, uh, account for the profits validly, you need to account for uh, the sales in the month in which the goods or services are delivered. And the mechanism by which you do that is you invoice it 
in the month in which those goods or services are delivered, regardless of when you receive the money, and if you receive the money in a different period, you've got this mechanism of a debtor by which you can keep track of the difference. The debtor appears in a balance sheet item, mirror images the creditor appears in a balance sheet item. If you haven't yet paid for goods or services that you've received, you can always use stock if the purchases happen in a different period to the sales, because the sales is king when it comes to the month in which the uh, sales or purchases needs to be recorded. But coming back to debtors and creditors, the uh, month in which you record the invoices is determined by the, the date in which you receive the goods or payments. And if you receive cash or pay cash in a different month, you create a balance sheet item debtor or creditor, and it's managing your debtors and creditors that can often be the difference between whether you've got a successful business because your cash flows are healthy and your relationships are healthy and good with your suppliers and customers, or you end up with a really poorly run business, which can fail, not necessarily because it's not trading well, but simply because it's not in touch, in control of its debtors and creditors or its cash flows. And hopefully you've now got all the tools you need to be able to keep on top of it so that you don't have uh, inadvertent uh, um, damage to the business simply because you haven't kept track of your debtors or creditors properly. So again, congratulations on getting so far. If you've understood all of this, you're again in a very good position for helping most businesses to keep, keep to record their debtors and creditors in the correct accounting period and to keep track of the cash flows and to help them run a successful and thriving business. So thank you for listening. Until the next time, goodbye.